Hello and welcome to another podcast from Adele Technology. Today, we're very fortunate in being joined by the CEO and co-founder of Leo Cancer, Stephen Toe. Hello and welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's great to be with you. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Stephen, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling the audience a little bit about your professional background and how you ended up where you are today, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a, a physicist by background, Stephen. I think once a physicist, always a physicist. So I'm uh, still got that huge passion for uh, for physics. And I've been in radiation oncology for the last 12 years now, um, both in, in large organizations like Electa, uh, but also as the co-founder of a radiotherapy startup company called Leo Cancer Care. Uh, so I started at Electa as um, a graduate physicist, so straight out of university and on a fantastic um, program of going around not only the physics department, but also marketing and sales, manufacturing installations, really getting a whole grasp of the wider business. Uh, and I ended up leading a small team of physicists as a product owner, developing the Unity MRI guided radiotherapy system, which was fascinating. That was combining an MRI machine with a radiotherapy device so that you can image an MR at the same time as treating with radiation. And that was a product that came from Electa. And as a physicist, it was just incredibly exciting to be involved with. Um, but I think getting to the end of that project and seeing that the technology that we developed was bigger than conventional devices. It was a lot more expensive than conventional devices, could treat fewer patients. Um, and really, you know, there was a no, there were a number of questions on the clinical utility of it. Uh, looked at that and said, well, while this is amazing technology, is it really meeting the goal that I wanted to achieve professionally, which was to bring radiation therapy to more patients globally? Um, so with that, really set out, really looking for uh, other, other opportunities still in this space, but with an ability to, to improve global access to radiotherapy. And that's when I came across a, a research group down in Sydney, uh, at the University of Sydney, that were developing a lower cost radiotherapy system. They were focused on really this brilliant initiative uh, and realization that the vast majority of the size, the cost and complexity in radiation therapy comes from the fact that we rotate a radiation source that weighs upwards of six tons around a patient that weighs say a hundred kilos, which you know is, is a little bit crazy when you think about it. Um, so they came to the realization that it made more sense to keep the heavy complicated object fixed and to slowly rotate the lighter patient. So I actually packed up my bags and moved down to, to Sydney in 2017, left the UK. And uh, what a wonderful place to go and live. The beaches were certainly better than Brighton Beach. The, uh, the weather was most definitely better. The food was better and the coffee, I think, was better as well. Um, so I spent a year and a half uh, down in Sydney trying to develop this concept of fixed beam radiotherapy. And initially it was focused on treating the patient lay down and uh, rotating them in a supine orientation with a, a, a vertical radiation beam. And that on paper was perfect because the radiation beam pointed at the floor. Um, but as soon as you need to bring a patient into that and you ask them to, to lie down um, uh, and rotate, the idea kind of falls over. Um, so very, very long story short, we came across research from places like MD Anderson and Northwestern Medicine that actually showed some really promising clinical benefits to treating patients upright rather than lay down. And when you put those two ideas together and you have the idea of an upright patient and a rotating patient in front of a fixed beam, then the value proposition really starts to make sense. Um, so I was brought in there in Australia as, as a, a technical lead to build a, an engineering team. But when the company uh, failed to raise money back in 2018, I kind of uh, stopped being a physicist or stopped being an active physicist and, uh, and took over as CEO and moved to America. So it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind uh, career for saying I'm still such a, 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 such a young age, but an exciting one. So Leo Cancer, this, this, this startup, as you call it, 
yeah. It's a UK US company, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And you're based in the United Kingdom primarily. I am, yeah. So I, I went all the way around the world uh, with Leo Cancer Care. So UK moved to Australia, then to San Francisco to raise capital, and then back to the UK again. And you have a co-founder as well, Stephen. Yeah. So if there is if there's any such thing as a celebrity within radiation therapy, it's not something where you normally think about celebrities, but if there if there was one, it would be Rock Mackey. And that's the co-founder of Leo Cancer Care. He was the founder of Toma Therapy and the Pinnacle Treatment Planning System. So he's been a, a real trailblazer in radiation therapy for the last 35 years. Okay, so you do photon and proton therapy. Could you explain to ordinary people like me what that what the difference is in this about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's the same principle, and, and most people, uh, when you talk about cancer care, they instantly jump to surgery, where you effectively open the patient up and you cut the tumor out. The next pillar that people think about is chemotherapy, where you're injecting what is effectively a, a poison um that that uh then really impacts the entire body but it's surprising how few people know about radiation therapy as a whole whether it's protons or conventional radiotherapy but that is the really the third pillar and 50 percent of all patients that are diagnosed with cancer receive radiation therapy as part of their treatment and the general concept of, of radiation therapy as a whole is that you fire this high energy radiation at the tumor and simplistically speaking, it kind of cooks the tumor, burns it out of the patient effectively. It's depositing energy uh, that breaks DNA strands in the tumor and kills the cells in that way. Now, the difference between protons and photons is an interesting one. So. 90 plus percent of the radiation therapy devices that you come across today in almost all of the hospitals, particularly in the UK, is conventional radiation therapy. So that is um, delivered by accelerating electrons that then hit this block of tungsten. They generate x-rays, very, very similar to the x-rays you used when, um, when people are, are imaged, but just at a higher energy. And those x-rays then are, are targeted at the cancerous tumor and they, uh, they kill that tumor. The protons very, very similar, apart from you don't accelerate electrons and turn them into x-rays, you accelerate protons. And those protons are delivered directly to the patient uh, and operate in very, very similar fashion. Uh, you deliver them, you target them at the tumor and they kill the cancerous cells. The difference is the way that those two things interact, the way that protons interact compared to those X-rays. And you can see if you Google difference between those two, what you typically see is people talking about uh, the Bragg peak um, when they talk about proton therapy, because for conventional radiation therapy, you deliver for 6MV, which is the, the most common treatment energy, you deliver your maximum dose at about 1.6 centimeters into the body. Now, unless you've got the tumor perfectly at 1.6 centimeters uh, inside the body, that's not ideal. And what you see is that you deliver radiation in between the surface of the skin uh, all the way up until you hit that tumor. And then the radiation continues to go through the body, delivering radiation after, tu after the tumor. So you've got this kind of pathway that goes all the way through the body where radiation is delivered. And what we've always done to kind of counteract the fact that this is non-ideal and that actually, unless your tumor is 1.6 centimeters in, you deliver most of your radiation to the healthy tissue rather than the tumor, is that we rotate the radiation beam around the patient. That's why the rotation is so important because what you're trying to do is effectively put the tumor at the intersection of a bunch of different radiation beams. And that way, you've got all of these paths that go through the body, but the only bit that sits in all of those paths is the tumor. And that's how you get that conformality of radiation dose for x-rays. Now, protons on the flip side, they operate differently. You don't get this same path of radiation that goes all the way through the body. They're much more targeted, and they really only deposit their dose as the proton slows down. So you get a little bit of radiation on the, between the surface of the skin and the tumor, 
but you get the vast majority of the radiation dose delivered at the tumor and you you, mo uh, you modify the, the energy of the radiation beam of the proton beam to match the depth that you're trying to hit but what you don't see is any radiation delivered after the tumor so very very long story short there proton therapy is effectively just a more targeted radiation type so particularly when we look at patients like pediatric uh, patients where you know they're going to hopefully live a lot longer uh, than patients that are treated kind of later in their life and we it's more important that we think about things like long-term side effects protons are more important because you're able to reduce the radiation dose to healthy tissue and therefore reduce the side effects associated with radiation therapy okay so you've talked about standing people up on a up in an upright position now yeah and you've talked about more accurate targeting could you tell the audience about how standing a patient up rather than lying them down delivers a more accurate dose? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. And it's, you know, this is all really based on clinical data coming from places like MD Anderson and MGH, Northwestern, uh, the Paul Shearer Institute in Switzerland. What they've all published uh, are these studies that show that internal organ motion seems to be reduced upright compared to to supine so take lung for example lungs are really interesting one both md anderson and northwestern medicine have published on lung what they say is that effectively when you're upright the diaphragm drops naturally under gravity and your lung is basically just like a bag of air effectively so as the diaphragm drops down it pulls the lung down and it gets you, it, it, it brings you a more inflated lung volume. MD Anderson showed that in some cases it was 50% bigger, your lung upright compared to supine. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, if you have ever been to the opera, then how often do you see an opera singer lie down to hit those really big notes? You don't. They're usually as upright as they can. And I'm a, I'm a pretty horrific singer. But when people tried to teach me to sing when I was at school, they'd say, you know, you need to be as upright as you possibly can. And that's because your lung is more inflated. Now, why does that result in a reduction in motion? If you think about taking two balloons side by side, you know, the really little ones that you would normally fill with water and throw at somebody you don't like, take one of those and then compare it with one of those really uh, brightly coloured large balloons for people's birthday with 50 written on it or something like that uh, or 21 in your case Stephen and uh, <laughs> if you put those two things side by side and you've got a syringe with the same volume of air in if you pumped it into those two balloons you'd see a lot more motion in that small balloon than you would in the big balloon so that's what you get in the lung when the lung is more inflated it results in a reduction in breathing motion for the same tidal volume of air. And that's just the example for lung, but there are these similar benefits that we see for the prostate that seems to move less. Uh, the tongue seems, seems to move less. The liver seems to move less. And motion is really your biggest enemy in radiation therapy. It doesn't really matter whether you're, you know, trying to um, use a bow and arrow or whether you're trying to target radiation at a target, it's the same principle. You're trying to hit something accurately. And if you imagine your bow and arrow and trying to hit a target that's moving around all over the place, that's really quite difficult. The moment that the target moves less, you should be more accurate with your bow and arrow. So that's the principle. The principle is that motion is your enemy, your enemy when you're trying to deliver these beams. And having the patient upright seems to reduce the magnitude of motion. Okay, that makes sense to me. So that, that most people should understand it then. Um, I think you've had a great deal of success in the United States initially. Would you tell the audience a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, um, the interest, the level of interest in proton therapy in the United States is, uh, is incredibly high. You know, there's a lot of these really big centers like MD Anderson and UPenn, for example, that have, have published some tremendous data on the use of proton therapy. Um, the problem has always been that it's, you know, while it's always made clinical sense, quite often 
it's been very difficult to make it make business sense. It's been very difficult to manage the cost associated with protons. Um, and a prime example of that is Stanford. So Stanford is, is one of the early adopters of our technology and really the, the home of radiation therapy. The first treatments that were ever delivered with a, a, a linear accelerator were delivered at Stanford back in the 1950s. Um, but they were, they were one of those sites that you would look at and say, well, they must have protons. Surely they've got proton therapy, but they didn't. And they'd actually tried for, for 22 years to bring proton therapy to Stanford. And when you look at the reasons why they'd not managed it, it was really the size, the cost, and the complexity of existing devices today. You know, if you think about how expensive land is, and I don't know, Stephen, whether you've ever been to the Stanford campus, but how little space there is on campus there at Stanford to, to, to build anything out, it's a real challenge when they're bringing new technology in. And just to kind of give you an idea of what existing conventional proton therapy pre-LEO cancer care looks like, I mentioned that those proton devices exist and operate by accelerating these protons. Well, what they have to do once they've accelerated them is they have to target them at the patient. So they have to bring them in and put them into this huge three-story, 110-ton structure uh, that rotates the radiation beam, this proton beam around the patient. And um, whenever you've got something that's a three-story structure, it's really difficult to put that inside of an existing hospital. You know, you can't just walk into most hospitals and find something that's a ready-made three-story structure. Everything's on a single story. So the way that we've always built these proton machines means that you effectively have to build a new hospital for them. And that's expensive in most places, but think about doing that at Stanford in the heart of the Bay Area. It's prohibitively expensive. So it never made financial sense. And it's the same in you know, San Francisco, New York, uh, Hong Kong, all of these places, it's really expensive to build these centers. So the reason that we've had so much success and we've been able to get uh, huge names like Stanford on board with this is that actually our technology doesn't require three stories. Because the beam stays fixed and you only have to very, very slowly rotate the patient instead, the surrounding infrastructure and the space requirements come way down. So now we're talking about something that fits into a, a complete proton device that fits inside of a conventional radiotherapy vault. So people in America have seen that already with their passion for protons and saying, hang on a second, this has always made clinical sense, yes, but now all of a sudden with Leo Cancer Care, it also makes financial sense. And that's why we've seen this huge, huge ramp and tremendous traction uh, in the US over the last 12, 18 months. Stephen, you've recently partnered with a Chinese company, and I think that that's the big game changer for proton therapy. Could you tell, could you tell me something about how that's going to work? Yes, yeah, so, so, so Mevion, absolutely tremendous partner for us, together with uh, research also from a treatment planning uh, perspective. Mevion's actually a, it's a Boston-based company, um, but they do have a huge operation also in China. So they're, they're based both in Boston uh, or just outside of Boston in Littleton, uh, and then also just outside of Shanghai in China. And the big breakthrough with Mevion is that their accelerator is the smallest out there on the market. So when you're trying to really reduce the size of proton therapy, um, by bringing Leo Cancer Care and Mevion together, you attack both elements. You're basically saying, how small can we make the radiation? That's what Mevion's done. How small can we make the treatment delivery, this ability to deliver beams from different angles? You, that's where Leo Cancer Care is essential. So uh, Dr. Lou from Stanford worded it perfectly when uh, we announced the, the partnership at Astro last year. He said um, that Stanford had been looking at compact uh, proton therapy and they'd looked at the conventional Mevion device with a rotating beam and all of the other proton vendors. And they'd really said, well, compact just wasn't compact enough. And for him bringing the Mevion technology and the Leo Cancer Care technology together, that's what really enabled us to go and install these things in conventional radiotherapy vaults. And Stephen, I've, 
know, like I said, I've been in radiation oncology for the last 12 years and I've heard so many industry leaders, you know, really intelligent people that, uh, that know the industry say that that was always impossible. So many panels and discussions have been um, uh, taken place at, at many of these big trade shows where people have brought up the future of proton therapy to say, okay, when are we going to get these in conventional vaults? And they said it was impossible, absolutely impossible. But now that's completely changed. It's absolutely a possibility and a reality. So if I'm sitting, if I'm the head of radiation therapy in an, in an organization like an NHS trust or in ARC in France or in Germany, and I was sitting with my CEO and they said, can we start a proton therapy for under 50 million or 100 million? Because it, it, that's quite feasible. Oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. And what we, you know, what we're really saying to people now uh, during those conversations with maybe head of radiation oncology and the CEO of the hospital, you know, people have looked at it in the past. Those conversations have taken place and people have evaluated it. What we're saying now is, is proton therapy has changed. It's not, um, it's not a three-year project to install anymore it's not a scenario where you're talking about a hundred million dollars plus it's not a case of something that takes an army of 10 people based permanently at your site to to provide service and maintenance this is is effectively slightly more complicated than a, a linac uh, upgrade but really not much more so what we're really saying is is to the scientific community to the radiotherapy community Take another look at protons again, because it's changed. Okay, that's exciting, for, I think, for a lot of people around the world. Also, I think you partnered with a university in the US on research. Is that correct? Yeah, we've, we've partnered with a number uh, of US uh, universities, also UK too. Um, so it's, it's something where we've really, I think, captured the minds and imaginations of the radiotherapy community. It's not necessarily an industry that's known uh, for for innovation and rapid change and you know if you take the back off uh, the, you know the covers off many radiotherapy systems it's actually the same technology at the heart of it that's been there for 25 or 30 years just with a slightly different set of covers maybe a new set of leds on the front but broadly speaking radiotherapy hasn't changed a huge amount in the last 25 30 years at, from the point of view of the core technology so when you do bring something to a, a trade show and something to the industry that looks so drastically different, people are interested in it. And, you know, we've managed to establish these tremendous research partnerships. Some in the UK, people like Sheffield Hallam, uh, Surrey, for example, we've done some amazing work with, with both of them. Uh, UCL, we've had a, a fantastic partnership with as well. Uh, various different groups up at Loughborough. And then over in the US, you know, we've we've worked with uh, a whole host of, of different universities uh, and different academic institutions. Uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, is now one of our customers we're working very closely with Stanford. Um, so, yeah, we've we've worked with a lot of different partners. And that's the only way you make these advancements, Stephen. You can very easily sit there as a as a technology developer and think about how you want to make something. But. We're not the ones using it and we're not really the experts from a clinical implementation point of view. So you need everybody to come together to make an innovation like this come true. Speaking of clinical implementation, you could also, I think, make a big difference to waiting lists in something like the National Health Service and other countries, can't you? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For, for a variety of different ways uh, and reasons as well, actually. So, you know, a paper that was published last year from, uh, from, from Vincent Gregoire and Sophie Boisbouvier over at Centre Leon Barard, they're one of our um, uh, research partners, the first centre in the world that ever installed our equipment. They published a paper last year showing that it is much faster to set a patient up upright compared to supine. And again, if you think about this logically, it makes perfect sense. You know, if you've got an elderly person and you bring them into the treatment room and you've got to get them lying down, the first thing that you do is you sit them on the side of the table. And then you've got to have a therapist that picks up the legs and another therapist that supports the back and you rotate them around 90 degrees and then you support that patient down again. 
Now, if you replay that workflow upright, you still walk the patient into the room, you still sit them down, but that's really the end of it. You've sat them down and they're ready to go. So they showed that you can treat patients much, much faster. You can increase patient throughput and therefore offer these treatments to more, uh, more patients. But there are also other, other things that come into play here. We've been doing a lot of reading recently, a lot of research looking at workplace injuries for radiation therapists. Massive, massive global problem. Everywhere in the world today, you struggle to find radiation therapists. These people should be paid tenfold what they are. You know, they're the real frontline um, interaction with the patient. They get into that career because they care about the patients that they're treating. And we can't get hold of them. We can't get hold of good radiation therapists in the world today. There's a huge shortage of them. And why is that? Well, if you look into it, part of it is, you know, part of it is pay, part of it is, is working conditions, all of those kind of normal things. But there's a massive problem with workplace injuries for radiation therapists. I think it's something like 75% plus of radiation therapists suffer from pain as part of their day job. Now, where else do you see that? It's, it's bizarre. We don't talk about it. It's not covered. Um, but there are so many papers that have been published that these therapists, they come to work every day and they're developing these, you know, these, these, um, these conditions, these, you know, these pains in their body, these uh, aches and pains just from their daily, you know, daily job. And when you actually look into it and, and think, why is that? it's getting patients up and down off a table. You know, the fact that they do care about their patients as they see this elderly person trying to lie down or trying to get up again, the first thing they do is, is uh, you know, reach out a hand to help pull them up or to help them get them down onto the, the table. And, you know, you do that multiple times a day and you start to get pain in, in the, the lower back, in the shoulders, in the back of the neck. And that means that they leave, you know, they leave that job or they go off work um, sick for a period of time. So being able to keep therapists in the clinic for longer by not having to help the patient lie down, you know, you don't, you don't have to do that in the upright orientation. We're going to put more therapists in the clinic and that's going to obviously then be able to uh, deliver more of these treatments to more patients. So there's a lot of different reasons why we think that we're going to increase access to radiation therapy globally. Okay, so we've discussed the health economics of the technology. And I was wondering if that's just the limit to everything that you've done. Is there something else more to this, to this, to this to being the entrepreneur, Stephen Turner? Yeah, so obviously the health economics is always really important whenever you're developing technology. And I think it's more uh, focused on now than it's ever been. You know, budgets are tighter now than, than, than ever before. People focus on value-based healthcare. So, you know, that is critical. And it's a big part of, of, of the value proposition behind our technology. We've also obviously talked about some of those clinical benefits that are important as well. The third big piece in my mind, and, and in many ways, the most important to me, is really the experience for the patient. And it's something we just don't talk about enough within healthcare generally and within radiation therapy specifically. Uh, and we focus on, on people being patients and the care that we're gonna give to them. And uh, we often forget that actually, first and foremost, they're human beings. And yes, they're patients. Yes, we're trying to cure them uh, of, of cancer, but first and foremost, they are human beings. So one of the big drivers for us is to try and do anything that we can to make that experience of receiving radiation therapy just a little bit less daunting, make patients feel a little bit less vulnerable and more involved in their treatment process. And the upright experience, the upright patient uh, posture goes a huge way, goes a very, very long way to doing that. And you know, if you think about um, any time, Stephen, that you've been for a job interview or you've stood up and you've given a big presentation to a large group of people, it's scary. You know, you, you do it, you go into it and, you, you know, you get those butterflies in your tummy and you, you get nervous about doing it. But 
going and receiving radiation therapy for the first time, you can multiply that by a hundred, you know, being diagnosed with cancer is the scariest moment in any cancer patient's life. And I remember, you know, I remember um, my dad being diagnosed with cancer and I lost my dad, unfortunately, to cancer, uh, which is why I got into this industry. But seeing him go through that, um, that process of being diagnosed and going through treatment, terrifying, absolutely terrifying for these, these patients. When you go into a room and you lay on a, a solid black table, it's a very clinical environment. It's an alien environment. You've never been there before. And you're staring up at the ceiling while all of these things are going on around you. You don't feel very in control. You don't feel empowered through that process. Uh, and it's the same when you go for that job interview. If you went into the room and you started getting asked questions, but the first question was, Stephen, do you mind just lying down through this process? It's weird. It's just a little bit strange, you know? So having the patient upright just puts a little bit more of that control back in their hands. They feel just a little bit more engaged. They can communicate with their therapist throughout the entire process, eye to eye, just as you and I are now. So it's, you know, communication is a big part of it. And, you know, like most people that got into radiation therapy and work in this industry, we do it because we care and we do it because we want to make a difference. So, yes, the health economics is important, the clinical efficacy vital. But if we can package those two things up and at the same time, just bring a little bit more of that human element back into radiation therapy at the same time. That's what gets me out of bed uh, in the morning every day. David, you've got published papers on this, haven't you? We do. Yeah, we do. Again, the paper that came came out of Lyon um, from, from the team there at Centre Leon Barad showed without any shadow of a doubt that patients felt more comfortable. They felt less vulnerable. They felt it found it easier to breathe, particularly for lung cancer patients or esophageal cancer patients. They felt less claustrophobic, less scared. Uh, in the upright position than they did supine and the therapists prefer it you know therapists they as i said they care about their patients they didn't get into that role for the money or because it's a glamorous role they got in it because they truly care about making a difference to those patients lives many of them have had you know family members impacted by cancer or, or themselves so you know we put a huge amount of pressure on them we say you've got 10 minutes or 15 minutes to treat this patient. You've got to get them in. You've got to get them out. You've got the next one that's coming. All day, every day, these therapists are constantly under pressure to get through the patient volumes that they're faced with. And when that happens, you know, they've got to kind of rush them in the room, throw them on the table, get out there again. And the moment that they lie that patient down, that communication is broken. You're not eye to eye anymore. And I've heard so many therapists say, you know what? I just love a little bit more time to engage with my patient. You know, that patient wants to tell you all about their grandson and what, you know, the holiday that they've been on and, and where they're going at the weekend. And they want to tell you, you know, all of those things about their life because they're also scared in that moment. And that conversation helps them to feel more human again. So the moment that you're in that position where they're lying down and they haven't got the eye to eye contact, that communication breaks down. And the therapist has two options. They either take longer in that treatment slot to make sure they're dedicating that time to converse and have that, that uh, detailed conversation with the patient, but they can't do that because of the patient volumes, or they don't have that engagement. So if you have the ability to have the patient upright throughout their ent entire treatment session, they're constantly eye to eye with that patient. They can have that conversation and connect with that patient in the way that they want to, but without sacrificing on the treatment slot. I think that's a wonderful story. I think you've actually hit the nail on the head with, with the difference you're making to a lot of people's lives. Stephen, you, you've got a large team of very, very good people in your organisation. How many people have you got now? Yeah, so it's a it's it's getting to be a fairly sizable uh, sizable team. You know, it's gone from a couple of people in a uh, you know in a living room uh, three and a half years ago, four years ago. We've now got a hundred people in the team, um, roughly split fifty fifty across the US and the UK. 
we're manufacturing in both locations. We've got a couple of people dotted elsewhere. Somebody's still down in Sydney um, and uh, somebody over in the Philippines as well. But yeah, 100, 100 people now in the team. So it's it's just amazing how quickly it's growing. That's amazing. I think that's an incredible achievement. And for you and your team, I mean, I know it's a it's 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 a world beating technology. It's a game changer. The other interesting thing I think is that you've got three or four devices that you've named after world beating women. Um, could you tell us something about that? Yeah, and it's it's again, you know, it's that we always say that we're a more human way to deliver radiation therapy. And I think from a patient's point of view, if you're going into a room and you're treated by a Gamatron 4000 or a laser knife, you know, those sort of things. Is that a human thing? Is it a is it something that 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 makes me feel more uh, at home, more comforted? I don't think so, personally. I think, um, you know, for us, it's been really important to do, you know, two things with the name of our products. We try and, and, and make it more human by giving them human names. You know, you're going into the room and spending time with Marie, if it's our proton therapy uh, system, or Ruby, uh, if it's our conventional radiotherapy system, or Ada um, for our imaging product. So it just, again, brings a more human element to it. But it also celebrates these just tremendous trailblazing women in science. You know, Marie Curie is the inspiration for, for our Marie product. Um, Ruby Payne Scott is um, an astrophysicist uh, who was, again, um, a real trailblazer. She's the inspiration for our Ruby product. And then Florence Ada Stoney uh, was the, uh, the first female radiographer in the UK. So if you read their stories, they never took no for an answer. They were real nonconformists. They, you know, they paved their own um, pathway through life uh, to, to reach the goals that they were looking for. So I think the naming of our products, it represents a more human element and trying to make people feel less vulnerable through their experience, but celebrates that nonconformist nature that we bring into you know, our approach to radiotherapy. We're not following the same path that everybody else has always done. We're looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes and going back to the drawing board. So I think that that should always be celebrated. I often talk about, you know, as children, we have this amazing ability to ask why. And you, you know, I've got a, I've got a four-year-old tomorrow, actually, Stephen. Uh, he is my little boy. I'm going on a long drive with him. He sits there and he's constantly, but why, daddy? Why is it always like that? Why have you done this? Why have you done that? Why are you driving too fast? You know, constantly asking why. And I think as adults, as we grow, we get less comfortable with that. You know, we start to fear, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask why because people will think I'm, I'm not particularly intelligent if I need to ask why. So I'll just accept that that's the way it is. People get more comfortable with that attitude them but why and i think that's why you know we we've not challenged those core principles in radiotherapy that all patients are treated supine and that the radiation always moves and i think you know something that that rock the co-founder brings he's one of those people that has never grown up in the nicest sense you know he constantly today still asks why about everything and that can be infuriating at times but that's that that kind of mentality that attitude is really, you know, at the core of everything that we do and was at the core of, of those trailblazing women in science as well. The other thing I'd like to mention to you is that because you're scientists and because you care and you've got this, you've developed this amazing, this amazing set of ideas that have formulated, accumulated, sorry, in um, these fantastic outcomes when it's not a standard approach that you take with healthcare systems. It's not a standard approach that you take with a hospital or a healthcare provider, you're, you, you, your problem solvers is really what you are. You are asking, why not? Why can't we do this? Why can't we look at things differently to how other providers would supply a solution? I, I've seen you do this. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think flexibility is, is key. You know, hospital systems today, they are under pressure. 
I think the economy, everybody in the world feels it. You know, people are in a position where they're trying to save lives, but they're constantly under pressure in the way that they do business as well. And I think, again, it's, you know, at the core of, of, of why we're doing what we're doing, it's to bring uh, greater access to high quality care. So if we're faced with a situation where our customers saying, you know, we're in a position where this is really difficult for us to work, well, let's, let's have a conversation about it. Let's be flexible about the way that we work as a business and the way that we partner, um, because the success of our customers is, is achieving our goal. You know, we can't go and deliver the high quality radiation therapy across the world as we want to. We, yes, we can develop the technology, but that's only a piece of the puzzle. So we're always looking for creative ways to partner, creative ways to work with, uh, with customers globally. And it's one of the benefits of being a small, small organization that you can do that. I think it's also worth mentioning at the end that you're part of a veterinary project as well, a really interesting veterinary solution. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, a big part of the story. So, you know, one of the reasons that upright radiation therapy hasn't taken off in the world is because it lacks upright imaging. So to be able to treat somebody upright, you have to be able to image them upright. And uh, we have as part of our core technology offering an upright uh, dual energy CT. And that CT technology actually came from a really interesting uh, other application, totally unrelated to radiation therapy, for imaging the legs and necks of horses. Uh, anybody that knows or has ever watched uh, horse racing, they think, people think that horses fall over and they break their legs. It's actually totally the other way around. What happens is that they have hairline fractures in the leg and as they're running in that compound um, uh, engagement with the floor over and over and over again, that repetitive impact, that's what makes the leg break. And when the leg breaks, then the horse falls. It's not the other way around. So there's this huge need and there's, it's gained tremendous amount of, of media coverage, particularly down in Australia at the, the Melbourne Cup. Now all horses that go into the Melbourne Cup are imaged with a version of our upright CT. So we've got this sister company that sits in their Asto CT that took the same imaging technology and used it for this totally different application, which was imaging the legs of horses upright while they're load bearing. And there's, there's a, a number of other companies that have developed CT systems for, uh, for imaging the legs of horses, but it's the only product that is weight bearing CT. There are other people that claim to be upright CT where you kind of stretch the leg of a horse into a CT, but that's not load bearing. You don't see these hairline fractures in the same way. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's had a huge impact on, uh, on horse racing and you wouldn't put those two things together. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting origin to that imaging tech. All right, Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure seeing you again. And I hope to be able to talk to you again in eight to nine months about increased success and the increased penetration of the technology. And I wish you all the very best for the future. Really appreciate it, Stephen. Look forward to it.